still life drawing mistakes, that's what we're going to be looking at in this video. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find all things watercolour, drawing tutorials, mixed media, even a little bit of business and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell icon, you can get notified every time I have a new video for you. I make at least one free video a week here on YouTube on a Thursday with extra content for Patreon subscribers. So in today's video, we're going to look at nine really important drawing mistakes that I see people uh, get in trouble with with still life drawing. Where appropriate, I'm going to point the camera downwards and actually give you some examples. I also want to just take a minute to explain to you why still life drawing is so important. So sometimes I've had complete beginners come to me and I've been teaching classes for about 20 years now. So I've had complete beginners come to me and say, well, I don't know where to start. What shall I start with? You know, what's the thing that I should start drawing? And I always recommend still life drawing to them because it's such a great learning experience. The good thing about still life objects is they don't tend to move, rot, bark, meow, run off. The scene doesn't change. Cars don't park in front of it. Clouds don't move. The good thing about still life is it pretty much stays where you put it, unless you have children or cats, of course. One thing I used to do when I started painting was I would put a still life on sort of on a tea tray and then I could carefully move it over to one side. So if you haven't got a permanent painting or drawing station, that's a, a thing that you can do. You can set up a still life on a board of wood or on a tea tray and just keep moving it back into position when you need it. It's a really great subject because you can take as long as you want over it. It's also kind of a microcosm of bigger things. So a small box on a table, you know, something like a, a box of tea bags, for example, it's just the same as a house. A house is basically a box. So once you start drawing these boxes, these cylinders, these vases, these mugs, these circular objects, you are working on a microcosm of the larger world. And everything you learn about perspective and drawing from observation of still lives will carry on to larger subjects. Now, the mistakes in this video are not just things that I've made up. These are my experience of seeing what people do wrong. As I said, over 20 years of teaching, painting and drawing, I've taught thousands of real life students. I'm going to share them with you right now. So let's look at mistake number one. Now, whilst of course you can draw still lives from photographs, these first two mistakes relate to drawing real life still lives. That's a bit of a tongue twister. And the first one is moving your position. So this regards um, your seated position. You know, you might end up twisting around, you might move your chair. Basically, you're moving your head, moving your viewpoint. Another mistake that people make is to sort of peer around the corner. I can't see what the side of that vase looks like. So I'll move my head and peer around and see what it looks like. Now, when you sit and look at the still life, you know, you're in a certain height chair, your head's at a certain angle, your body is in a certain position. You have a fixed set of uh, perspective points. You are looking at all of the objects in front of you from one perspective view. As soon as you move your head, you're going to change that perspective. Now, if you were outdoors and you were drawing a landscape or painting a landscape, for example, now it wouldn't make as much difference because you have got such a vast area in front of you. Moving your head, you know, slightly to one side or the other isn't going to make a whole lot of difference to you. However, when you're painting or drawing something that is so close to you, what you're going to find is that even, you know, even moving your head to one inch to one side could mean the difference between seeing the side of a box on the table and not seeing the side of that box or seeing round the corner of a vase or not seeing. So you don't want to peer around corners and try and see things or look up and try and see what the top of something looks like. You must keep yourself still and keep your position still. So make sure when you start drawing that your chair is in a comfortable position and that you just make a mental note of roughly where you're sitting. You don't change chairs. You don't change positions and you certainly don't peer around to look at things that you can't see. If you can't see it, it shouldn't be in your drawing. Now, I talked at the beginning about how still life just more or less stays put. French call it objet mort, dead object, I believe that is. But generally speaking, still life doesn't move. However, there is an exception to this, and this is to do with light levels. So the still life may not move, but the light levels may change significantly, especially for somewhere like here in the UK, where our light levels go up and down all day. The sun goes in, the sun comes out. One minute we're getting sunburned in the afternoon, it's snowing because that's what the weather's like here. And it means our light levels fluctuate 
saturate a lot. On certain days, it's just murky all day and never seems to get light. But if you start your drawing, and this is, you know, you don't have to be outdoors for this to happen. This is if you're indoors and perhaps you're, hopefully you're near some kind of light source, like a natural light source, like a window, you're going to find that your light levels move. You may also find that the room gets dark and you put artificial lighting on. And that's going to move all of the uh, reflections, all of the shadows, all of the light sources, all of the highlights on your still life. So this is something else that you have to consider. And it's worth when you start out, what I tend to do um, actually, even if I'm working from real life, and I do advise you to work from real life with a still life, I do take a photograph at the beginning from my viewpoint and I kind of, just on my phone, and I kind of capture the light levels and I capture where the shadows are. I may also sketch very lightly the edges of the shadows in at the beginning because if five hours later you know you've gone through the late morning and it's the afternoon, you may find that the, uh, the sun has moved, the light has moved, everything's changed. If you start putting things like spotlights on, you're going to get multiple shadows. So really important that when you start your still life, hopefully you have some natural lighting on it and just make a note, make any sketches. You could do a thumbnail sketch. You could also take a snap on your phone just as a reference of where the light levels were when you started drawing. So the next, and to be honest, one of the biggest mistakes and one of the things that will stop your drawing from being a success right from the get-go, and that's not planning your layout in advance, just starting drawing in the middle of the picture with no idea of scale or size or where things are going. I'm gonna show you, I've talked about this in other videos, but I'm gonna show you specifically how to plan a still life layout. So let's point the camera downwards and have a look. So I've got a still life photograph here and let's have a think about this now. This is as big as the paper that I'm using, but normally you might end up with um, either um, things in front of you on the table or you might end up with a smaller photograph. So it doesn't really matter. I want you to start to think about the overall shape of this still life arrangement. So if you're a beginner, what you would naturally try and do is perhaps maybe draw the bowl, draw the things in the center, and then draw the things on the outside. The problem with that is you have no way of knowing how big it's going to end up and how it's going to sit on your paper. Now, I did a video recently um, about drawing mistakes and I showed people a fish and I wanted the fish in the middle of the paper, but I didn't do it correctly, so it ended up over to one side. This was an example of not judging the scale of something. Now, a lot of people said to me after that video, but Michelle, the fish could have been swimming off the side of the picture, you know, that's fine. That wasn't the point. The point was not that the fish couldn't exit the picture, which of course, if you um, balanced it out in other ways, it certainly could. The point was that you wanted it in the middle, but you ended up with it over to one side. So that's what I want you to avoid um, happening. What can happen with still lifes is they can end up far too small. So they're just a tiny little thing swimming in a huge expanse of paper. Another thing that can happen is that they can end up right over to one side. So in other words, they go off the edge and again, it's not completely wrong to take something off the edge of your paper, but you would need to balance it out. If, for instance, this went off at this edge, you might want it to go off at this edge too, so you were kind of zoomed in. But if it just touched your paper on one side and not anywhere else, it would look like it was stuck to one side. It wouldn't work very well at all. You could even find that you do it too big and it comes up so large that it ends up completely going off your paper and there's, you know, whole objects there that you wanted in the picture that just aren't there anymore. So the first thing I do is to decide which way around the paper's going. And I do this by looking at the whole um, arrangement as almost one shape. So imagine if you drew around here with straight and curved lines, what sort of shape would this look like? And would it be oblong or would it be vertical? This can be very deceptive. You can sit looking at something with a tall vase on your worktop in front of you and think that this must fit into a portrait shape picture. And yet, because of foreshortening, when you do this exercise of imagining a square or a shape around the outside of the whole of the objects as a group, you might find that actually it's not portrait, it's square or it's landscape shape. So that's the first thing I would think about is which of those three shapes it's going to fit in. What I'd do then is I'd start by making some marks on my paper. So I'm gonna move that out of sight. You don't need to see it. So what I would do is think to myself, well, I'm not going to allow that, uh, that apple at the top to come higher than this. And I'm not going to allow that pear over the side to come further out than this and the other one here. And if we look at the furthest forward object, it's 
this here so we take a straight line and we can see that the pear comes down lower than the apple and again I'm going to make a mark and say well this is not going to come down lower than this so you see what we've done already we've made a, a container for our still life it's not getting out of control it's not going to just end up anywhere from there I'm going to start sketching you know a rough shape of where the uh, where the still life would fit and start thinking about it from that sort of thing and you know an angle up here you can see that it goes fairly straight up here and already I've got an area where it's sitting on my paper I might want to consider then is there perhaps a center point so if we've got one side and the other side where is the center in that it's not necessarily the middle of the bowl is it it would be probably over here a little bit so again I can drop a center line down and I know that the bowl is over to one side and I can think about finding you know a center line the other way as well so almost making a cross in the middle and where that would be between the top and the bottom I would say it would be just below the rim of the bowl and again I can put that line in the other way there and I can start to think about where these things are lying and you can see that they end up really you know much smaller than I had previously thought and this is just a starting point so I'm just getting that starting point there and just thinking about where things might be sitting in relation to how they sit on the paper and then I've got the uh, the fruit in the bowl. I've got a couple of things. I've got a plum here, and let's take that round there. Get the base of the bowl. Now you can see how rough and how scruffy all of this is, but you can also see that I've managed to fit everything nicely on my paper. And then once I've got all of that working for me, I can start. You know, I can start really tidying up, and really thinking about where things are going, and really starting to get some more shape on my objects. I've got this apple at the front here that's quite large and it goes in front of the bowl here. And in this way, I start to really get an idea of where everything sits. I won't bore you by drawing the whole thing, but can you see how much a better approach this is than just starting drawing in the middle and allowing your, uh, your work to either end up way too small. I see people do these tiny little still lives in this big expanse of paper or end up with it being way too big. Now, it just so happens that the photograph was the same size, more or less, as the, uh, the drawing paper, but that's not the point at all. You could be working from a tiny photograph. You could be working from a huge still life in front of you. You still want it to sit nicely on the paper, take up the majority of the space without going off the edges. At this point in the video, can I ask you, as always, if you're enjoying this video and getting some value, please could you click that thumbs up button for me? At the time of making this video, I have about 58,000 subscribers. I am so grateful to all of you who watch me here on YouTube. If you like, subscribe, leave me a comment or share this video. YouTube will push it out to more people and that helps my channel to grow. So the next mistake I have for you is putting corners on ellipses. What's an ellipse? Well, it's something like the, uh, the circle of my drinking glass here. And too many people get this wrong. I'm going to show you several methods of plotting and drawing ellipses so they always look perfect. So an ellipse is a circle viewed from the side. So for instance, it would be the top of this bowl here and the base of this bowl here. You can only see half of the ellipse at the base, but if this was a transparent item like a glass, we would see all the way through and see that circle on the side. It could also be something like this roll of tape. You know, the more it's twisted to the side, the more you can see that ellipse shape. So it could be deep, it could be narrow. But one thing you'll notice about this is it doesn't have any corners. Now, one thing I often see, particularly when people are trying to fit an ellipse in a specific shape, like um, the top of a cup or a vase, is they'll have the sides of the object like this. And what they'll do is they'll think, right, well, we, we start around here and they don't want to make any mistakes. So they're going to dot it. We go like this and then we'll go like this. And by drawing slowly like that, trying to be accurate. And what happens is you end up with something that has a corner. Now, we've just decided that um, ellipses can't have corners. No matter how narrow they become, they are still fully curved. So a much better way of drawing this is to draw from the shoulder and to draw in one go. So what I'm doing now, 
I'm drawing mostly from the shoulder and from the uh, from the elbow. You can't see my arm, but certainly you can see that my hand is not moving at all. My arm is moving my hand. And do you see how I get a much more beautiful circle that way? Now, of course, it's not exact. So you want to pick the bit that you like the best and then you can go around and strengthen it up. So this is a great way of drawing an ellipse. Another method that people sometimes use, if you tend to sort of go off to one side, you can use the cross method, whereby you measure the height of the ellipse and the width of the ellipse, and then you place your ellipse within these marks. Now, I don't really like to use this method because I find it quite hard to draw freely in that manner that I've just shown you whilst using the cross method, but that is another way of doing it. What I prefer to do actually is to draw my ellipse and then afterwards I can take a center line up and I can take a center line the other way and I can see if each of these segments is fairly even. If I've drawn an ellipse and you know it's not very even at all and I try this method, so here we go like this and then I find the rough center like this. You can instantly see then which part of your ellipse needs adjusting the most. And you can pick one of these and say, well, actually, I think this one here is the best one. And so I'm gonna make them all that size. You can measure from here to here. Let's check if it's the same here. If we measured from here to here, we'd find it was significantly longer than this side, which means I need to take this side out a little bit further. So that's how you get a beautiful curved ellipse and it should never have corners. The next mistake is one that I frequently see, but it's so easy to fix. I'm gonna show you how to avoid getting your top and base of an object, particularly something like a tall vase, out of alignment by using guidelines. Let me show you how it's done. So I've drawn a bottle here. It's a little bit wonky, it doesn't look too bad. What we've got here is we've got the top and the base out of alignment, and you'll be astonished at how far out it is actually. So if we look at the top of this bottle here and we find roughly a center point, and then I take a set square. And I do like to keep set squares and rulers near me when I'm working. That doesn't mean that I draw along them, but they're just useful for checking things. So if I now line this up with the base of my paper and go down that center line from the top of the bottle. So here we are, let's take that center line down the middle. Now look how far out the base is it's way over to one side. We've completely shifted it across. And this will often happen, especially if you're one of these people that tends to you know, work sideways with your work, this can happen. So what I advise you to do is to uh, not even get to this point. When you uh, start to draw a tall object, I advise you to put a center guideline down the middle, you know, just a very, very light guideline. Do keep them light so that you can erase them later. But you know, if you think um, the middle of your object is here, then whatever it is that you're drawing, you should be able to just get an idea of, of how it sits on the paper, you know, draw the top and the bottom and make sure that they're roughly even. And then you can, from there, you know, go out and do whatever kind of object or bottle you've got. But if you've got to this stage and you're already in a mess with it, what I suggest you do is to take measurements so you can decide which side you like the best. I actually think this side looks quite nice. So what I can do then is I can measure. So here I've got eight millimeters. Um, apologies if you're American and you're used to inches, doesn't matter how you measure. You don't even, if you haven't got a, um, a set square available, you don't even need one. You can just use a piece of paper, mark your center point, and then you can use that piece of paper to measure across. So I can now measure, and I know that the end of it needs to come here, so I can actually start making that symmetrical. I can check my measurements at any point halfway up as well. So the bottle's quite wide on this side. So here I've got, what have I got, 2.2. So again, I can go out here. And you can also, if you um, want to make sure that you're keeping it exactly aligned, you can take a straight line at a right angle to that center point across here. And again, either using a piece of paper or using something that you measure with, 2.2, we can go here. And I know that at that point, I need to be out here. And in this manner, you can straighten up your object 
and get it working much better. I suggest that you put the new lines in before you rub the old ones out. It can be really helpful to do it that way. But before you ever get to this point of needing to correct, just drop a center line down your tool objects before you draw them. So the next mistake I see is when people try and place one object behind the other, they kind of almost grow the object on the side of the one in front. It never leads to accurate drawing. I'm going to show you a much better method of placing one object behind another. So did you notice with my first drawing I was uh, sketching through things so I didn't just sort of stop things and go round them. I took the objects all overlapping each other and there's a very good reason for doing this and it's because you'll draw much more smoothly and you'll get things much more accurate. For instance here I've got this, uh, this piece of fruit at the top of the bowl here. I can just take out those lines that are in the middle later on when I've got it right. So let me show you how people sometimes go wrong with this. So on this piece of paper, I've drawn myself a little bottle or vase. Now, if people want to draw a bowl behind it, what they'll tend to do is they'll tend to try and draw the bowl like this and you know try and put it in place and try and get an idea of how it sits. It's really, really inaccurate. You end up with something that doesn't look natural at all because it's very hard to draw something that you can only see part of round something else. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to draw through. So now if I want to do my bowl, I'm going to think about drawing through and putting that in there. Almost imagine the object in front isn't there at all. And there we are. I've got a bowl drawn. Looks much better. So now all I do is take out the bit. This is assuming that it's not a, a glass vase. And actually, if it was a glass vase, this bit here would um, have a bit of a refraction, so it would change slightly, the shape would change slightly. But if you're just putting something behind like this, you always want to draw through, again, with you know a piece of fruit, maybe we have an apple that's sitting here. Again, you want to draw through the thing that's in front because you will just get a much better, much more natural looking effect that way. You can then just rub out the bit that you don't need and you've got an object that sits on the paper looking nice and natural. You haven't tried to just awkwardly draw around something. It almost never works. Next we have a perspective mistake. Have you ever drawn a cube, a box or even a cylindrical object and found the top of it looks like it's tipping up towards you? This is very, very common. I'm going to show you a simple way of fixing it without any maths involved. So let's look at this idea of tops of things and cylinders um, tipping upwards. So imagine we have a cylinder on here. Perhaps it's one of those tubes that you, uh, you get crisps and things in. That's chips if you're American, obviously. So um, imagine you've got the top of this. Um, it could be anything. It could be a vase. It could be a mug on the table. And you draw the top like that. And it just looks like it's tipping up towards you. Um, the same can happen with boxes. So let me draw a box. So we've got the sides of the box here like this. Let's go about here and about here. And then again, you draw the top of the box and it just looks like it's tipping up towards you. Basically what you're doing is you're not foreshortening enough. So you don't have to work out a load of complicated perspective. If something looks like it's tipping up towards you, you want to lessen the angle and shorten the depth. So what I mean by this is this area here has to be shortened. So if we just make it shorter like this, you'll see how that suddenly starts to lay flat. Again with this, we're going to lessen the angles here. See how tipped up this is? We're going to take it down a little bit. We're going to lessen the angles. We're also shortening the depth. In this way, you will get your box and the top of your cylinder, your tube, laying flat. It's a really, really simple trick. It actually doesn't just go for still life, so we can use it for things like uh, rivers and pathways. I've explained more about that in other videos, so do have a look at the, um, the playlist I've got on drawing if you need to, uh, to know more about that. But it's a simple trick that if something is tipping up towards you, lessen the angles, shorten the depth, and it will lay flat. The next mistake is drawing the base of objects that are circular and sat on a table like a glass or a vase, drawing the bottom of those objects flat. 
This is something that happens because our brain starts playing tricks on us. We try and analyze something and the logical part of our brain kind of clicks in and we say to ourselves, well, the table is flat, therefore the bottom of the object that's sitting on it must be flat. But that's not true. Let me show you an easy way of figuring it out. It's gonna make so much difference to how realistic your objects look. So this one is so common and it's not just beginners that get it wrong. So let's do our vase or our glass again. And there's the top of it. And here are the sides. And it's sat on a table and the table is flat. So I guess the bottom is flat. You can see it just doesn't work. Now, although the table is flat, the object that's sat on it is an ellipse. So what you will see instead is this. Now, even when people don't go to the extreme of doing the base completely flat, because they know the table's flat, they have a tendency to flatten it more than it should be. So often, you know, you, you might have the, uh, the top of the object like this. And then what will happen is that the artist will just, they'll, they'll know that the bottom has a curve on, but they, they keep it quite low like this. But that's incorrect as well. The other problem we've got here is you can end up with a corner on this here, on this bottom, you get this sharp corner. Again, as we've already spoken about, there are never corners on an ellipse, it has to be circular. Now, the interesting thing is that if, and let's improve that one at the top a little bit, that if this is um, sat on a table in front of you and you are looking down at it as you would generally be, what you'll find is that the bottom ellipse should actually be deeper than the top ellipse. So, I haven't got the camera on me at the moment, but if you grab something with a circle on or a mark or something like this, and you hold it directly in front of your eye line, you'll find it becomes a straight line. The lower you place it, if you push it downwards and hold it lower and lower below your eye line, you'll see, you can see more of it. It becomes deeper and deeper, and the same if it goes above your eye line. So assuming that your things are on the table and your eye line is above, here is a very badly drawn eye. You are looking down at the top of the object, but you are looking more down at the bottom of the object because it is lower below your eye line. The opposite will happen actually if it goes above your eye line, but because you are looking further down at this, the ellipse at the base here should actually be deeper. And if it was a glass object and you could see all the way through, it would be more like this because the lower below your eye line, something travels and do try it yourself. Hold in front of your eyes a roll of masking tape, sellotape, or even just a mug, and see the difference between how much of that circle on the top you can see as it travels below your eye line, and you will find that the lower you put it below your eye line, the more you're looking down at it, the more you can see that circle, and the more rounded it becomes, and the less flat. So therefore, an object that sits on the table in front of you must have a deeper ellipse here. Even if you can't see all of it because it's opaque, you still need to get that curve. It will have a deeper ellipse at the base than it has at the top. And this simple trick, just getting rid of that flat base on things, you'll be amazed how it can make them look much more realistic. You also want to make sure that as you get the sides of the object here and they come down and join that curve, you do not want any perceptible corner there. You want to make sure that you knock out any corners. You shouldn't actually be able to see the point where the straight line starts becoming a curve. It should just naturally join up. If you have a corner here, it's just the same as I showed you before on the ellipse. It will start to make your object look two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional because it will almost look like it's cut out of paper rather than being a three-dimensional object. So this next mistake is all about composition and not planning and not considering the composition of your picture. In other words, making it pleasing to the eye. So still lives can be quite interesting. They can also be extremely boring if you get the composition badly wrong. So this is not only about layout and getting things as we spoke about at the beginning of the video, sitting nicely on your paper. This is actually making them pleasing to the eye and finding a way of leading the eye into your picture. 
So if it was a landscape, you might do this with a river or a street. You know, you've all seen those paintings where it leads your eye right into the distance very nicely. You can do exactly the same with a still life. And you want to be looking at using angles. So you might consider bringing one object slightly further forward. You want to be looking at getting an angle that leads your eye into the drawing, takes it around the drawing and back to the beginning again. So if you have a look at the graphic that I've put up for you, you'll see exactly how this is done. So I want you to consider not only when drawing, but also when setting out your still life. Is there a way that you have of leading the eye into the picture? Another really clever thing to do is to have two objects that are the same and bring one further forward. So one is larger and one is smaller. Make sure that you're not flattening everything to be the same size and scale and don't be afraid of making things that are closer to you a little bit bigger. So do let me know in the comments if you've been making any of these mistakes. Also let me know if you have any questions about drawing. Later on this year I'll be building an online course and I would like to know what you struggle with in regards to drawing because that will be a beginner's drawing course. Before you leave this video don't forget to pop into the video description and grab some free downloadable PDFs to help you with your painting and drawing. And at the end of this video we looked at composition. If you need more help with composition do consider joining my Patreon. All my patrons get a free downloadable PDF of composition tips. It's fully illustrated and they get that on joining. If you would like to know more about drawing mistakes and drawing tips, I have a great video for you that was all about the top 10 drawing mistakes that I see people make. You can watch that video right now.